This is the word of God from the book of Revelations, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, from the New Living Translation. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have, examined, you have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each, or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I do. Anyone with, ears mu- anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give the fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Amen. You may be seated. It's good to be back after a few weeks of travel and ministry, and I want to thank each of you for your prayers and for your intercession on our behalf as we were in different contexts to minister God's word. The Lord blessed, the Lord protected, the Lord gave us a tremendous time both in India and in um, Turkey. And I'm going to show a few pictures regarding Turkey. Now, next to Israel, Turkey is the most important place for Christians. How many books do we have in the New Testament? 27, okay. 18 out of the 27 books were written from or to the churches in Turkey. So that itself shows how important Turkey is. And uh, we also need to understand that all the main apostles ministered in Turkey. Paul was born in Turkey. Paul ministered in Turkey. And um, uh, so we need to understand the importance of Turkey and all the seven churches that we read in the book of Revelation is found in Turkey. And we have Paul, John, Timothy, and uh, Peter, all of them ministered in Turkey. So Turkey is very important. And Turkey was the capital of Christianity from 325 AD to 1453 AD. So for centuries, Turkey was the capital of Christianity. And so we need to understand how vital studying what is happening in Turkey and uh, regarding the Christian faith is important. And uh, Turkey is also a very large country. It is uh, much, much, much bigger than Israel. It is comparatively, uh, uh, if you want to compare to any states in the United States, it is much bigger than California. California has 163,000 miles, uh, square miles. Turkey has 305,000 square miles. It is bigger than Texas. Texas has altogether about 269,000 square miles, but Turkey has 305,000 square miles. And uh, the population is uh, m- much larger, 84 million. California has 40, approximately 40 million. 
But the sad part is that uh, what was the capital of Christianity now is dominated by Islam, 99%. Only 0.2% is Christian. That is the saddest part. It is because uh, that some generations did not do their part. So what happened in Turkey can happen to us individually and to our families and to our churches. So I want to briefly um, go over a few things, uh, but I want to quickly go through some of the places we were in, in India, not all the places. Darjeeling, uh, that's a picture from the room at about six o'clock in the morning. That's a hundred miles away. That's the third highest peak uh, uh, in the Himalayan range. And so you see how majestic, how big, and how uh, tall the mountains are. And that you get a view of the Darjeeling city and the mountains behind. And we had a wonderful uh, meeting at the Bible, uh, our Bible uh, school. And we br brought about uh, 170 people only by invitation because we didn't have space to accommodate everyone. And these are our graduates and people that were saved or pastoring our churches in the Darjeeling province. Alali and I sharing and ministering. And uh, these are our graduates who are pastoring the churches in the tea gardens in uh, Darjeeling. All of these people have come from either Buddhist or Hindu backgrounds. So we are grateful and the intensity of worship is amazing. And so we are grateful for what God is doing in Darjeeling. And uh, we had a great time. And that's Pradeep on to the right of Lali and Monson to the left. And the church has prayed for them. Both of them have gone through serious health issues. But the Lord has sustained them and bless them, and the work continues to prosper, and we are grateful for what God is doing through them. Another place, Punjab, uh, we had, uh, uh, this is the Nepali church. We have a tremendous outreach to the Nepalis of Ludhiana City. Uh, the city now has about five million people, more than five million, the second largest city in Northwest India. And we have an outreach to the Nepalis. We have nine churches in the city of Ludhiana just to reach out to the Nepalis. Between four to five lakhs or 500,000 people from Nepal are working, employed uh, as laborers. And so this is a church um, facility that we're going to construct. And we are laying the foundation stone. And all those people are people that migrated from Nepal came from backgrounds. And we ordained 21 of our graduates. We give full pastoral ordination only to those who plant churches. So these are 21 who successfully planted churches with uh, uh, in each of them may have from 60 to two to 300 people baptized believers in their congregation. So we are grateful for what God is doing in Punjab. That's right in front of our Bible college and the pastors there. So we are grateful for the work that the Lord has been doing in Punjab. There were other places, but I don't have time to uh, 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 show those slides. That's Turkey, uh, right <clears throat> in the middle of the Middle East. And uh, that is uh, right below the bridge that across the Bosphorus Strait. Bosphorus Strait is a sea. It's a natural strait, 19 miles long, 2.3 miles wide. And Istanbul is the only city in the world that is transcontinental, meaning it, has, it touches two continents. On one side is Europe, the other side is Asia. And there are three such bridges that touch uh, both the continents and you go across. And beautiful view. And this is the best time of the year. We had perfect California weather while we were there, and we thoroughly enjoyed our time there. There is much to see. This is a military academy on the Bosporus um, uh, Strait. 
and it's very deep. This is the only connection between the Mediterranean Sea in the south and the Black Sea in the north. And so uh, this is the only way that uh, ships from Ukraine, Russia, Georgia can go from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean Sea. And this is a natural strait. And so you have the Istanbul is a big city. One, nearly one fourth of the population of Turkey live in Istanbul. Just in the city limits alone are 16 million people and the greater uh, Istanbul, they estimate, is somewhere between 21 to 25 million people. Very congested. And uh, uh, next to India, you have major traffic problems in Istanbul. And mosques and mosques everywhere. And they have converted what was the original cathedrals that the Christians built into mosques. Beautiful, large mosques, but several of them were cathedrals built by the Christians. And, uh, and, and now we come to, uh, the, the, this is uh, 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 Smyrna. Uh, we passed Smyrna, and then we came to uh, Pergamum. And uh, this is the, and right next to a synagogue on the left side is a gymnasium. And uh, so I'm going to go through a lot of slides quickly, but I'm going to comment. Uh, on these places and when you go through these ancient ruins you have stones and piles it is not easy to walk and uh, some some places the steps are more than two feet high so it is uh, very difficult to walk in those places but you see the ancient ruins some of these ruins are going back to the days of 100 BC when Roman emperors were ruling and uh, uh, th these are different sites in different places, all these different churches. And this was a cathedral, again converted to a mosque, and a huge mosque. This is the only remains in Theatara. And, uh, and you can read about it, and that this is in the heart of the city. Less than 20% have been excavated. So most of the things have yet to be excavated because most of the excavations have been done by the British or students of archaeology from United States. So it takes a lot of money for excavation. And since the Islam have dominated the place, they have not allowed or given people to come and excavate these places. So... Uh, what you see is it's all built around. So if you need to excavate things, they have to demolish the buildings, which they don't allow. And so less than 20% of the sites have been excavated. And uh, so when they find a place, they try to put a big shelter over it. And very slowly, the students of archaeology go stone by stone and unearth the things that has been there for centuries. And these are all different places where the seven churches are. And uh, here, another uh, mosque. Uh, the women are not allowed in the main, uh, main section. And just like it was in the centuries past, only the women can be behind the fence. And that's where you are allowed. For centuries, the Muslims did not believe that women had a soul. And so they were not even allowed in the mosque. And now if you go, you're allowed to that fence. You cannot go beyond that place. But beautiful architecture, wherever you go, this is in Laodicea. You know, Laodicea is a place where they talked about uh, uh, medicinal water. There was a medical school, school for the, uh, where they treated the blind. And people came here for... Uh, bathing and uh, it had it's uh, like a lukewarm w water at a lot of mineral deposits so people came from ancient uh, times to these places even today people come for um, uh, to enjoy a bath in the hot springs again this was a this was a cathedral a christian cathedral that was converted into a mosque they painted over the christian paintings and now Archaeologists have 
uh, removed the layers and have seen the paintings that are behind, uh, uh, behind these uh, paintings. So you see what has happened. Hierapolis is this place, and uh, my two surprises was how large Hierapolis is. And Hierapolis was a place from where Paul ministered, uh, wrote the letter to Colossae, and uh, uh, you know, sent those letters. And these are the remains and the ruins in Ephesus, and uh, again, mosques in Istanbul. And uh, this is um, a, a gate going into the place of uh, the Atara uh, uh, church. And uh, uh, this uh, are all the remains in different churches. This was a synagogue. And you see the table that was used at this big synagogue. And right next to that gymnasium that I showed a while ago. And so you see the ruins of the temple of Diana or Artemis. And, um, and you see how these things have been unearthed and excavated and preserved. And you see how whatever has been stated in the word of God is true. And uh, again, another place where they are put a big structure to cover the place while excavation is uh, going on. And this is um, something that was erected in the fourth century. And uh, there are four pillars. You read about the imagery of the pillars to the church at Philadelphia, that I will make you a pillar. There are four pillars still standing in Philadelphia, massive pillars. And in fact, the day that we were there, they unearthed a huge uh, a, a portion of a pillar that was unearthed the day that we were there and they brought that to this site. So they are still excavating and they found that pillar while they were digging for construction in another place. So uh, this is back again in one side of Ephesus and now you'll see the Istanbul in the back and, um, and now I will Fast forward, that's Philadelphia, and uh, near Laodicea, and uh, now we come close to Ephesus. You see the ruins there, and I want to, uh, sh sh that's in Sardis, mosques in Istanbul. This was where Apostle John was buried. And this is the tomb of Apostle John. As you know, John spent the last uh, maybe 35, 38 years of his life in Ephesus. And these are the remains of, uh, in Ephesus. There's the tomb of St. John. And this is the house that the disciples built for Mary and John. And John took care of Mary till she died. And she died in Ephesus. And this is the house where they say that Mary was uh, lived and uh, died. And she was buried in a place not too far from this location. And so you get an idea of what is uh, in Turkey. And I pray that this will whet your appetite. And I have hundreds of pictures, maybe at a later time. When we meet at home or something, we can go through the slides and help you to understand the importance of Turkey. And I encourage all the families that uh, regularly go to India or you go on a vacation, you can take Turkish Airlines from Los Angeles and go to India via Turkey. And you can stop in Turkey for no extra cost, but then you have to pay for the visit. I would encourage you to do that and you will get a good idea of what is uh, uh, in Turkey and uh, how important Turkey is to our Christian faith. But pray for Turkey. 99% of them are uh, Muslims now, and only 0.2% are Christian. So pray that God would raise up more people to go and um, minister in Turkey. Now I want to turn your attention to the text that Tabby read. Thank you, Tabby, for reading the word of the Lord. I want you to come back to Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And um, 
I want you to uh, say the word sell shuck. One more time. Sell shuck. You know what that means? That's the modern name for Ephesus. That's the modern name for Ephesus. So this is the letter that Jesus dictated to John to be read in the church of Ephesus or Zelchak. Not only for the church in Ephesus, but it is a letter meant for all of us followers of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the founder and the Lord of the church. And he's the one who said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the seven churches are all found in the Western um, Asia Minor. And these are literal churches, as you saw a while ago, the pictures. These are literal churches. These are not imaginary places. These are specific locations where the word of God was proclaimed and people came to the Lord. So when you go to those places and read the letters, you realize that it contains a wealth of uh, local uh, color and allusions and imagery that is very pertinent to the people that live there and understand what is in that environment. When you understand the church of Ephesus and read about it, both in the book of Acts, and uh, Ephesus is the only uh, church out of the seven churches where its history is recorded in the book of Acts. And you can read about its history in chapters 18 and 19 of uh, Ephesus. Um, this was a very important city. It was a chief port of uh, Asia Minor. A lot of trade took place. It was at a strategic location where the roads converged and met and also it, uh, a lot of trading took place by sea. And this was the famous of all the seven churches. And I was surprised how large Ephesus was. In the time when Paul wrote this, there were probably in the neighborhood of uh, maybe four to 500,000 people that lived in the confines of the city. Even now, what has been excavated is a very large area. We went to several different places, and one was a very large area. You had to walk a lot in that place. And it also was close to a very large amphitheater that seats 24,000 people. And perfect acoustics. One man without any PA system can speak and address, and all the 24,000 people can listen to it. In a couple of other places, there were two uh, amphitheaters side by side, seating 9,000 in each place. And when you look at that place and the construction of that place, and this was built 100 BC. It has been there for more than 2,100 years. And you see how people were able to speak and it carried through and they had concerts, they had all kinds of assembly and functions in those places. So Paul ministered not only in private homes, but also in public places and public uh, gatherings. And the main attraction of Ephesus was the Temple of Diana. It was also known as the Temple of Artemis. And we read of that in um, Acts chapter 19, verses 24 through 41. When you read that, you will understand how important this temple was and it brought a lot of tourists to this place millions of people from all over Asia would come and worship at this temple and the temple of Diana was one of the seven wonders of the world it was 425 feet long 220 feet wide and 60 feet high now an American football uh, uh, field is uh, 360 feet uh, long and 160 feet wide. And so it is bigger than the American football field. And the temple had 127 pillars. 36 of them was overlaid with gold and precious stones. 
and the, all that was gifted by the king. But the image of Diana, you think Diana is such a beautiful person and all that, but the image of Diana is dis depressingly disappointing. It's a repulsive figure. A woman has two breasts, but this goddess had so many breasts, and it was a repulsive figure. And uh, people worshipped this goddess, and it was the goddess of fertility. And not only was it the goddess of fertility, and people who wanted uh, uh, children would come and pray, but there was also orgies that took place in the temple site. The temple site was filled with hundreds of prostitutes. So people not only came to worship, but they came to engage in immoral sexual uh, 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 activities. So it was a place of filth. It was a place of immorality. It was a place where every kind of shameless things took place. Uh, and uh, this image of a woman, repulsive figure with many breasts, and one hand was a club, on the other hand was a trident. That was the figure of this goddess. Uh, there was a famous, uh, the most famous citizen of Ephesus is called Heraclitus. He was one who made significant contribution in the area of cosmology. And he was known as a weeping philosopher. The reason why he was a, called a weeping philosopher, the most famous citizen of Ephesus, he said, I'm so ashamed of the uncleanness and the shameless acts that go on in my city. I never want to smile or laugh. He was never found to smile or laugh and he was always weeping. And this was a pagan philosopher and that was his assessment concerning Ephesus. And Ephesus was a very superstitious city. People were notoriously bad. And they were known as people who were fickle, uh, uh, superstitious, and sexually immoral. And so this was what was going on on a daily basis in Ephesus. And you read, when you read in Acts chapter 19, how when Paul was preaching, riots broke out. You know the reason why riots broke out? Many people were converted. Many people were converted because, and then they stopped buying the idols, the icons of Diana. And when they stopped buying the icons and idols of Diana, people, silversmiths and others lost their business. When the business people lost money, they began, they had a union, they joined together and caused riots and made sure that Paul was driven out of Ephesus. But Paul spent more time in Ephesus than any other city. He spent 30 months in two, two different stretches. He spent 30 months and some say a little more, approximately close to three years in his ministry. He never spent this much time anywhere, wherever he went and planted churches. But Ephesus became the strongest place where he trained people. And Ephesus, by the time Timothy was handed over the church and Timothy was the bishop, there were 50,000 baptized believers in Ephesus. They were not meeting in one, it was not one mega church. They met in many homes and many places throughout the city of Ephesus. In other words, by the time Timothy became the bishop and B uh, Timothy was overseeing the work, more than 20% of the population of Ephesus had become baptized uh, uh, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are uh, grateful for the wonderful ministry that the Lord did. And, but at the same time, there was a lot of opposition and there were riots and he was driven out of uh, Ephesus. But Paul labored and Paul was used of the Lord. There were tremendous miracles that took place. And what were the kinds of miracles that took place? People brought their handkerchiefs. People brought their aprons. And they just laid it there. And if Paul touched it and they took that handkerchief and laid it on the sick, they were healed. You remember when Peter would uh, walk, his shadow would fall upon the people that were on the cots and they were healed. 
So it was miracles after miracles. And the word that is used there is interesting in, in Greek is that it was not just one miracle that took place. It was not just an occasional miracle that took place, but a series of miracles that took place in Ephesus. The Spirit of God was moving. Why? Because the Word of God was being proclaimed. He hired <coughs> the hall of a philosopher called Tyrannus. He hired it from 11 a.m. in the morning till 4 p.m. every day. For five hours he was teaching, he was preaching, and he was explaining, he was answering questions. This was the Bible school that he established in a rented facility and trained people. This was where he trained Timothy. This was where he trained Tychicus. This was where he trained Titus and sent them to various places. And we read in the word of God that the word multiplied. The disciples multiplied and thousands of people came to know Jesus Christ. And all of Asia Minor heard who Jesus was, all from Ephesus. And to this church, Paul is writing. And Paul wrote, uh, wrote the, the best uh, letter on, uh, uh, that he wrote concerning the church he writes to uh, Ephesus called Ephesians. And when he writes to Ephesians, what does it say? Remember that you are seated. Where are you seated? Where is a believer seated? In heavenly places. So Paul is reminding a believer about his position in Christ. Today, this afternoon, if you are a believer in Christ, yes, you are seated on that chair in this uh, worship uh, sanctuary. But positionally, spiritually, you are not just seated on this chair. You are seated in Christ in heavenly places. That is your position. That is my position. I am seated, exalted in a high position. That is what Paul taught. But by the time Revelation was written about maybe 35, 36 to 38 years after Paul wrote Ephesians, what does John say? What does John say? Remember, you have fallen. Remember from where you have fallen. Paul writes of how exalted they were, how in a high position they were. But a generation later, 36 to 38 years later, when John writes and when Jesus who has X-ray eyes looks into the heart and the minds of the people who were in that church, he says, yes, you were high and exalted. <coughs> the Lord called you. The Lord blessed you. But you have fallen from that place. And I want you to remember that. And so... Paul prays two prayers in Ephesians for the church at Ephesus, for the believers in Ephesus. He has two desires, two wishes. One, he prays that the believers in Ephesus would have more light. They would have more understanding. They would have more knowledge. <coughs> they would have better illumination. Better discernment, better understanding of who God is. Then his second prayer, when he prays in and writes to the church at Ephesus, is not only do I pray that you have more understanding, more light, but you have more love in your life. And then when John is writing and uh, he's taking the dictation from Jesus, John says, You have fallen from your position. You have lost the insight and the light of understanding of who you are. And now you lack the love and you lack the first love in your life. So Jesus is addressing and he starts this letter by praising the church at Ephesus. What does he praise them for? He praises them for their faithful works. You have been faithful. You're very busy. You are very active. You have a great program in your church. You have a lot of meetings. You're very busy, very active. And Jesus commends them for their activity in the ministry. Commends them for their good works. 
I went to a church uh, about 28 to 29 years ago, maybe close to 30 years ago. The announcements took one hour. I still have the bulletin in my file because I'm a student of church health and church growth. It took one hour. Two couples read the announcements. Eight pages long. One hour. Lot of activities. Lot of ministries. But I think that's too long. <laughs> announcements, one hour. The service was more than four hours long. It was right here in Los Angeles. More than four hours long. But one hour for announcements. This church also had a lot of activities, a lot of meetings. And Paul or John is commending, Jesus is commending, I commend you for your magnificent program that you have in the church. Plenty of activity. But then when Jesus looks at it, says you have a lot of works, a lot of activity, but there is no blessing. You're very busy, but you have lost your first love. In other words, no love, no light. No love, no blessing. No love, no anointing. No love, the hand of God has been lifted. You can be active, you can be engaged, you can do a lot of good things, but unless you operate for the motivation of love, God's hand of blessing is not there. And that was the complaint that Jesus had against the church of Ephesus. It was a magnificent church, and they were orthodox in their teaching. They knew how to smell fake people. And even if apostles came and claimed they were apostles, they discerned. They had the gift of discernment to discern whether they were good people or bad people, whether they were fake people or not. You can go to the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul. We went there. And there are 31 streets, 7,000 shops. You can buy anything. You know, we bought a fake Vuitton bag, a regular bag. When the steward here saw, he said, I want that bag. I said, it's a fake bag. He said, it doesn't matter. I want that bag. And uh, uh, an American Airlines stewardess wanted that bag. I said, I bought it in the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul. When you go and, and, and negotiate with them and say, you know, they start off with a high price. And I negotiate and use my Indian bargaining skills. And I told them, this is not real. It's, it's made in China. It's fake. But he said, it's a good fake. <laughs> That was his comeback. I said, do you have better fake? I have good fake, better fake, and best fake. That's what they sell in the Grand Bazaar. That's what they specialize. And Ephesians, the believers in Ephesians knew how to discern what was fake and what was real. And that's the kind of world that we live in. They were very strong they were very orthodox. But when Jesus sees through his x-ray eyes, you have lost your first love. Then he, bless, he commends them. You have rejected evil. You know what is evil, you have rejected evil. In uh, chapter 2 of uh, Revelation, verse 2, you have rejected evil. But yet, you have rejected evil, you are orthodox, you know the teaching, but yet there is something that you lack. And what was the thing that they lacked? There was no good motivation of love. They were doing everything out of duty. They were doing everything that I must do this. This is something I'm, 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 uh, I'm forced to do it. A lot of people serve the Lord out of various motivation. Some people serve the Lord because they want the praise of people. You do things so that people will praise you. Some people serve the Lord because they want prestige. Oh, the community will recognize me and I will have prestige. 
Some people serve the Lord for the sake of uh, position or reputation. And some people serve the Lord because of a sense of duty. And Jesus is saying, if your service to me is not out of devotion, love, and passion for me, it is worthless and useless. And so Jesus is warning, giving three warnings. Number one warning, remember from where you have fallen. Remember you were in an exalted position. God placed you in heavenly places and that is your position in Christ. But you have fallen from that place. And I want you to remember. So never lose the memory of what God has done. For us. And never lose the memory of what. We have done to God. How often we have. Grieved the Holy Spirit. Grieved God because of our attitudes. And because of what we have done to him. We grieve God. We grieve the Holy Spirit. By our lack of love. By our lack of devotion. By our wrong motivation, we grieve God. The second warning, again from the text, not only remember, but repent. Repent. That's a warning. What is repentance? You're going the wrong way. You realize you're going the wrong way. Stop. Make a U-turn. Once we were going from Toronto to New York driving. This is 31 years ago. We stopped to have ice cream. And then we got on the freeway. But it was the wrong freeway. We were going the opposite way. We went about 30 miles before we realized we are not seeing the signs to New York. We are seeing the signs to Toronto. We took the exit. And went back. When you repent, you have to stop what you are doing and go the opposite way. That is repentance. Repentance is not merely saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is more than words. It is works. You have to show that you are sorry by your action. By your works. When John the Baptist baptized people, he baptized prostitutes, he baptized tax collectors. After he baptized, he would tell them, go bring fruits of repentance. In other words, he was saying, don't go back and live the way you were living before. Go produce the right conduct in your life. Repentance is not merely saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is where you not only say I'm sorry, but you show through your action that you are truly repentant and you're going the way that God wants you to go. That is repentance. First you remember, you engage your mind. You remember what you have done. You realize the mistakes you have made. And uh, you say sorry to God. Then you repent. You repent not just with your words, but with your actions. And the third thing. You return to God. You return to God. God said, there is one thing that is in your favor. Remember that? He said, you hate the Nicolaitans. Who were the Nicolaitans? We are not 100% sure. But there was a man called Nicholas of Antioch. You read of him in Acts chapter 6 verse 5. He was one of the seven that were chosen. And they say that he backslid. And not only did he backslide. He also started teaching false heresy. He said, you have been saved. You have the grace of God. You're no longer under the law. And since you're no longer under the law, you can do whatever you want. God has accepted you. You are secure. 
Now that was the teaching of Balaam. You remember Balaam in the Old Testament? You remember how, you know, he would not listen to God and finally God had to speak to him through a donkey. Sometimes if you don't listen to God, God will use a donkey or something that is out of the ordinary to speak to you. Uh, you know, you, he will get your attention one way or the other. A friend of mine, a pastor, he used to say, God fixes a fix to fix you. Now, if you fix that fix, he will fix another fix to fix you. And a lot of people spend their time fixing fixes instead of getting fixed. God knows how to fix you. And if you don't listen, he will fix another fix to fix you. So the earlier you repent, the better off you are. And this is what happened. What did Balaam do? Balaam was enlisted by Balak, the king of Moab, to curse the people of Israelites. He said, I'll give you a large amount of money. He offered money and Balaam was motivated by greed. He wanted money. Money was very important. The dollars. Anytime he saw a dollar sign that attracted him. He was constantly after money. And there was that greed in him. When you're motivated by greed, you make stupid mistakes. When you're motivated by greed, you make mistakes that you later on realized that was stupid on my part. So I said, I will do it. So when he went to open his mouth, what happened? The Holy Spirit did not allow him to curse the people of God. They are the chosen people of God. And God did not allow him to curse. And instead, beautiful prophetic utterances came out of his mouth. And then he confessed to Balak. He said, you know, the other people of God, they are the chosen people of God. I'm not able to, even if I want to, I'm not able to curse the people of God. But then he came, comes up with another scheme, another plan. He said, I'll give you a plan that'll work. He said, you use your Moabite girls to seduce the men of Israel and commit fornication. That was the plan of Balaam. And this was what Nicholas started teaching. He says, you're under grace. You can do whatever you want. God will forgive. By the way, God's standard has not changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. He's the same yesterday, today, and, and forever. God's character never changes. The Ten Commandments was not just for the Old Testament. It is for today as well. The Ten Commandments is for today. It is not just for the Old Testament times. It is for today. God's holiness has never changed. That's why the angels always say God is holy, holy, holy. The angels don't say God is love, love, love. They say God is holy because... His love is perfect love. It is love that is couched and cemented and founded on the holiness of God. So whether you are young or old, don't take the grace of God for granted. Don't think that God's standard has changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It has not changed. Holiness is required. You cannot commit fornication and serve God. You cannot be sexually immoral, think that God will accept. No, God will not accept. You need to understand the standard of God is high and we need to submit and with the help of the Holy Spirit, God will help us to be victorious. And finally, the final charge. What is the final charge? Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to what the Spirit of God is saying. In other words, listen attentively. Don't play with your phone when you are listening to the Word of God. 
listen respectfully realize you are in the presence of the living god god knows god holds you god knows everything about me and i need to listen carefully for me to receive the word of god i need to listen earnestly attentively and respectfully and to those who listen the word of the lord is given and the final promise is the risen christ will give to him to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of god what happened to adam and eve in the garden of eden what happened they ate from the tree of knowledge they failed to eat from the tree of life and because they failed to eat from the tree of life and ate from the tree of knowledge they were driven out and an angel with a flaming sword was kept on the entrance they could never enter but now the risen lord says if you submit to the lordship of christ if you overcome i will give to him the fruit of the tree of life and what is the tree of life it it stands for immortality it stands for eternal life so if you eat from the tree of life you will live forever and ever and ever and that is the gift of god in jesus christ and that is the paradise and paradise is where jesus is and that is the blessing that we have and that is the message that god wants us to understand that he has given to the church of ephesus but he has given to all of us divide your heads